Recording. So here we are, back at our final CISSP study session. So we're going to be going all of, uh, through the last areas and also give you a bit of a rundown. So we're going to start uh, basically covering the final two areas and um, make sure that you know those. Um, but first of all, if we have him here, I'm going to uh, give you back over to Jason and uh, let him go over some of this stuff again. Good on you. Thanks, Craig, and I hope everyone can hear me. So my name is Jason Howth. I'm a course director here at Charles Sturt University, and I, I did present uh, a little bit about our courses in the first presentation of this course. just want to briefly uh, recap for those uh, who are interested. This um, short course that you've enjoyed is, in fact, a compressed version of one of the subjects that we offer in many of our master's programs here at Charles Sturt University, ITE 514. That's part of the Master of Information System Security, which you can see up there, the structure of that course, very uh, industry focused. That course is a mixture of what we call academic subjects and industry content based on actual certifications in the marketplace. Now, you can see down the bottom that if you complete the CISSP certification, which is hopefully going to be one of the outcomes of this program, um, you can actually gain two subjects credit into this course. Now. We allow people into the course who don't necessarily have an undergraduate degree based on their work experience in the industry. Please get in touch with us, or if you want to find out if you're eligible, um, yeah, contact me, jhowth at csu.edu.au. Now, our programs are entirely by distance education in environments like this, online delivery, and you can see from the graph there that we're actually the market leader in Australia in distance education, so we are very experienced in this area. Um, you can also look at this graph here and see that in terms of uh, IT postgraduate, which is your master's uh, graduate certificates, etc., for domestic Australian students, we're actually the leader in the marketplace as well. So we're not minor players. We know what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I encourage you, if you are interested in going a step further after you finish this great course, um, get in touch and talk about perhaps enrolling in one of our master's programs. So thank you, Craig. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, I'm still the same person, still the same details, all of that sort of stuff. We'll also uh, go over some of the bits and pieces at the end for study suggestions, etc. Um, and remember, there's lots of materials that we've been putting up there, and there's lots out there on the internet that we can use to inexpensively go through and pass everything here. So we have this based on a whole lot of those materials, and some of these things are actually better than the ones you pay for. That's the interesting bit here. And what we're going to do is use all of those. If you've already gone through it, you should be able to see that we have all those uh, links there. Um, screen is a go, but no sound. I don't know why people aren't getting audio. Um, being that I can uh, hear Jason, etc. I think um, well, some people are. I don't like go to meeting. What can I say? Um, anyway, we have all this stuff. And remember the main prime focus availability, integrity, and confidentiality. These are the main areas. So, um, Jason, can you hear this fine? Are other people there able to hear fine? I'm just waiting to see. Jason, can you hear me? If you're still there. Out. The broadcast is now starting. Try All attendees are in listen click only. Click that on and off again. Is that coming through now? I really hate GoToMeeting at times. It can be quite annoying. All right. Anyway, as I was saying, security principles. Three main areas, integrity, availability, confidentiality. We should know the difference. There's a big difference between having a secure system and having a system that actually is doing something that is useful. 
it is extremely important to know the difference here. And this is what we're trying to learn in this process. We have to make sure that we have confidentiality. This is the thing in security we talk about all the time. But we also need even more for most businesses, availability and integrity. So this is why they're in that order. So we're going to start with going over quickly some security architecture and model issues, looking at the principles of security architecture and models, and basically understand the computer systems that we have if we're going to be able to create a secure network. So we have all the normal everyday things, operating system, memory, storage, input, output, security components, and networking. And the second part of this is the networking component of it all, and we will cover some of the aspects of networking, the seven layer cake and all of the rest, because if we can isolate our network well, we also get rid of a lot of the big problems that we're going to have accessing our systems. So CPU, we call this the brain of a computer. It's not really a brain. It's that simple. We have to think about how we do things, but it's the processing unit. It really comes down to what the computer does. So it, we call it the brain. In reality, not the brain at all. So. It has registers, little memory locations, it swaps things out, it does things like that. It basically, well, takes and matches and, um, well, allows the execution of programs to occur. So in that we can have um, different things like programs running. So these are not as we see it in, in uh, language, but uh, zeros and ones, that's all the computer actually runs in. And depending on whether it's at a user mode and or privilege mode, it allows the CPU to do different things, access different layers. We're going to go through layers in a little bit, so I won't go into too much yet. Uh, but we also have addressing and um, other such things. And um, we have to get that to and from different aspects of the computer. And if a hacker or someone else can get in there and intercept or change any of that, then, well, they can actually start causing us damage. So they can change what's happening and affect the availability, the integrity and the confidentiality of what's occurring on our computers. Now, modern computer systems have more than one CPU, either through multiple cores, multiple CPUs itself, whatever else. And that allows us to have more of these things running at one time. They can either be doing it as a symmetric machine, all CPUs are available for all programs and processes, or asymmetric where we reserve one for the operating system and um, everything else goes across different ones. It depends on what we're doing. So if we're looking at real-time operating systems, then we specifically reserve one for a process and have other things operating in different ways. And doing this, and We have, and I'm probably going to sneeze in a second, I feel that way, but um, we're going to have to actually think about how this is engaging. So we have, well, different things running at different times. And from a programming point of view, this becomes difficult. When we're looking at multi-threading and whether things finish or end at the same time or whatever else becomes important because we can have race conditions and other such things. So multi-programming models and how it occurs becomes important. We have to think about what occurs, whether we're going to use one process on one CPU or switch between things. So some terms you'll need to know are things like cooperative multitasking or preemptive multitasking. There's some good write-ups on uh, Wikipedia and other such sites. The main areas you'll find in Wiki isn't a be-all and end-all. Now, if you're using Wiki, don't think that that's the end of everything you need to know. What you need to know is, well, get out there and use it to get in uh, and start finding out info. Find out what you need to know and move on. So wiki, read it up, and the main bit that wiki will give you are all those little bits at the end where you can look for more information. So multi-programming. You need to know running, blocked, and sleeping modes. So when you're running, when the program's actually executing, for example, right at the moment I have GoToMeeting and I have PowerPoint. These are running. They're out there chewing up front memory. They're not uh, sitting there waiting or anything else. They are there 
and going. Blocked. These are things waiting. These are out there waiting to occur. Um, don't know. Um, I can't say anything about GoToMeeting. It's being recorded at the moment. Um, it sometimes drops for people when there's lots of people on here. Your your connection may or may not drop. Okay. Anyway, blocked. You're waiting for something. So generally speaking, if you are concerned with uh, limiting access to a device, then programmers can lock into something. For example, back in the days of modems, only one person could use a modem, one program could use a modem at a time, so waiting for it would be blocking it. And sleeping. If it's not active in memory, it's not at the forefront of memory, it might be put off into disk or paged or something like this and waiting. So it's stored and awaiting things. And we need to think about how we access the CPU. So there's a bit of reading, there'll be some more going up there tomorrow and all of this. Um, and you need to understand especially a thread. So threads are lightweight processes that really allow different parts of the operating system to run at what is approximately the same time. So example, you can print and edit. So same document, it splits off another version of itself, memory copies, and uh, the print can copy exactly what's there now and keep going. So it enables you to, in effect, do multiple things at the same time. So it allows you to schedule, um, allows time critical processes to have a higher scheduling, allows things to compete. One of the things of course that we have with uh, attackers is they jump in there and they try and push up their process so that they can go ahead of the admin who's going to try and knock their process off, especially when talking about things that are dosing machines. And the other one is deadlock. If two people are trying to grab the same bit of memory, the same resource, the same hardware, whatever else, that can cause a problem. So these are some terms you need to read and understand. We need to ensure that things are secure. Now, the operating system has a variety of different models to ensure that when you have multiple processes, they don't overlap and run different bits of memory at the same time. Now, this can be extremely critical, especially when we're talking about operating systems running, well, not just different bits of memory, but shared memory. For example, if you have three users all on one computer at the same time, and one of them is accessing something and and they're putting, uh, well, passwords into memory, you don't want others to grab those instructions. So how can, uh, how can I analyze, find instructions of a stack from a process thread? Do I have, to, um, do you have to reverse engineer the program code? Ooh, so how do you find instructions? Well, if you have something like IDA, um, you can reverse engineer things. It depends on the privileges you have over the operating system. You're really analyzing memory to do this. So when you're looking at what's happening there, you have to grab the memory and be able to analyze it. To do that, you have to have low level access to the system, which we'll cover in a little bit. So encapsulation, we need to think about how we um, grab our processes and hide them. So one process cannot read write the same space of another. This is important. We do have debugging rights, which allows people to actually overwrite this. And you can think how dangerous that would be if you can start overwriting the, the controls around memory, then other users could access our processes. So we want to separate that. And we want to be able to share resources fairly over time. We want to name things differently. Process ID, which allows us not to have um, any overlap. And we also want to make people think that they're on their own individual process when they're running things. So we have virtual mapping. This makes it simpler for programmers. They don't need to worry about all the memory mapping issues that they did in the past. So when we're looking at .NET or um, neural Linux systems or whatever else, or Java, then 
they don't need to think about which area or memory they're running in, they just run. So when we're looking at this virtual mapping, we have our real addressing and our virtual addressing. So different programs can run in what appears to them to all be the same base memory. They don't need to worry that it happens to be uh, in different areas of the computer. Of course, we need memory management. This protects the operating system, it protects the applications, and it maximizes performance. If it's done properly, it means, well, we can't easily overwrite areas of memory, which has been a problem in the past. Buffer overflows, etc., have been because we've been able to jump across the end of boundaries and do things we shouldn't be able to do, overwrite sections of memory that we're not meant to get to. So programs don't need to know the, t uh, the type and amount of memory, and if we can hide all of that, then we can make it easier for programmers to code securely. Other terms, uh, relocation, protection, sharing, and uh, physical organization, these are all different areas of memory management. You don't need to know the in-depth details, but you need to know really what the differences are. So for things like registers and, uh, and all the rest, and I'll be putting up some extra reading for those who want to go into depth on this topic. Uh, I don't have enough time here. We've got to fly through all of this, of course, but um, I will be loading up some extra uh, material, things I've done in the past for those who want to go into memory management and other areas. All right, need to know about RAM, random access memory, DRAM, dynamic random access memory, uh, SRAM, SDRAM, EDO RAM, DDR RAM, DDR2, 3, etc. So we have all these things, EDO, look ahead, SDRAM, etc. Uh, what our refresh needs are and all that um, really depend on the different types of random access memory. ROM, on the other hand, is read-only memory. It's non-volatile, non-writable, uh, good for firmware. It's um, going to be non-writable, so uh, this makes it more secure. So the thing is, once you program it, you can't change it. And that becomes, well, an issue if you need to change it. If there's a problem, you basically have to um, change a chip or something like this. For those who have been around for quite some time, they probably remember the old um, uh, issue with Sun machines back in the day, like back in the Sun 4 days, where you had to actually change ROMs, physically change ROMs on machines. So we learned, um, well, we moved away from that to make things a bit simpler with PROMs, programmable PROMs, uh, programmable ROMs, and then EPROM, which is a programmable uh, read-only memory that can be erased. Uh, you take a little tag off and everything wipes. EEPROM. So it's erasable electronically. And this is where we're moving towards now. So when we're looking at uh, things like BIOS, uh, then we're going to have um, all of this. Unfortunately, I can't do much for the, um, the sound quality over the connection. Uh, depends on your link versus my, uh, whatever else. I mean, at my end, I've got a, um, uh, a symmetric uh, 100 meg link. So, uh, with guaranteed quality of 80 meg per second. So all I can say is my link to the internet is actually pretty good. From there to everywhere else in the world, no idea. So it varies, unfortunately. Uh, all I can do is say that, well, I've covered everything on this end. Okay, flash memory. All should know what flash memory is. Probably not, but anyway. Cache memory. This is really, really expensive and fast memory. The idea with cache is it's really quick, so we can move things in and out quickly. Also need to know a few other terms. Memory leaks, virtual memory, and swapping, paging, and etc. So memory leak is where we don't clean up the memory that we've used correctly. So we've allocated memory, we've been writing to it, but we have not got rid of it. So. Um, at the end of the day, sometimes you have um, memory that you don't clean up. So CPU modes and protection rings. This is not real. Okay, this is an abstract and a model. But what we're talking about is most privilege to least privilege. Ring zero is our kernel. This is the core of our device. This is right down there, touching the hardware and where we're allowed to do anything. So ring zero 
the low level root stuff that we can, might be able to get to if we allow ourselves to do anything that allows us to write directly to hardware. This can be really dangerous. You can, for instance, crash, uh, crash computers really easily at the kernel level. If, for instance, you try and write to the, um, the same memory as you have uh, video cards, well, blue screen time. We have our operating system at ring one, device drivers at ring two, and applications at ring three. So our least privileged, what we should be doing is calling APIs. And those APIs will allow each level to do something a little bit lower, protecting us as we go. This level of protection means that it's much harder to get in there and um, cause all these problems that will crash the system or break the security of it. The idea is code in one ring can only access objects in the same ring or request using an API something ring to ring. So ring three, ring two, that sort of thing. That's the idea of the model. We're jumping and requesting so that we go down. So we have our operating system, kernel level, uh, remaining parts of the OS that most of us um, talk to, the IO drivers, utilities and applications like our web browser and each of those should have to go through one level at a time. The rings allow the operating system basically to go through, well, a write, a call in a controlled manner so that we can maintain trust and that's what we're really looking at here, trying to maintain, maintain trust. We have different operating system architectures, so for those who haven't really done too much about term computers, I've got lots of reading for you here, but we have monolithic kernels. For instance, if you're talking about something like a Linksys router or something like this, that's a monolithic kernel. One big flash and there it goes, the whole lot in one. There are advantages and advantage, uh, disadvantages in this, of course, in that, well, you have one block of code and that's it. If you want to replace it, you write over that block of code done. Of course, if you want to patch something, you can't just load a patch. You have to replace the entirety. So patching is overwrites and it can be problematic to say the least. If you want to control a little bit of a change, then you've got a lot to, um, to suddenly fix. And um, on top of that, we have to think about how we're going to be running that privilege versus unprivileged. We've got virtual machines popping up more and more. Personally, I run lots of the damn things. I'm, I'm a very heavy virtual machine user. And we have to think about how we code things. So um, I have some more stuff on 8.16 and whatever else registers that I'm loading. I'm not going to go into it right now, but I will have it there for people to go over later. That will be up tomorrow. We have to think about IO management, how we're doing it. DMA, direct memory access pre-mapped memory versus uh, uh, other issues and um, interrupts. So those who remember the old days back when we had modem sitting on one particular interrupt and all that will remember all this. And that's really it for computing terms. We're not going to go terribly much into that because I also want to spend a little bit of time going over the types of questions. So we need to think about the questions that we're going to be doing as well questions at the end of all this are important. So system architecture, it's really about the security principles. We want to make sure that we have something that allows control over confidentiality, integrity and availability and this is what we're trying to address when we're talking about this in architecture. We start with a trusted computing base. This is the combination of all these protection mechanisms we put together. The hardware, the software, the firmware, all this comes together to enforce trust. So we're trying to create something that ensures a predictable level of operation. So you need to know trusted computing base. This is the thing that comes down to everything together, how it really takes the system and provides trust. It's not some technical thing, it's a concept. It's a trusted path. We know that we are setting up things so that we have some layer of trust between our operating system and all the rest. We are doing this in a way 
that allows us to ensure that, well, we can control what's occurring. So, security perimeter. Not everything falls within our TCB. Different things sit out there. This is the imaginary boundary that is untrusted. User land. How do we access everything? How do we access the center of our thing? And what we, we have is a reference monitor. So again, abstract machine, not real. It's all concepts. When, when we're talking about how we access the kernel and how we do all these other things, this is all a conceptual abstract. But we need to understand the theory because that's how we're going to be developing all of this. So the abstract here in the security monitor is really why we're doing it so that we can tr uh, create a trusted computing base that allows us to isolate processes. Now, we all know this doesn't work perfectly. And we're, we're aiming for tamper proof, but the reality is nothing is tamper proof. There is no perfect security system, no system that can't be bypassed. What we're doing is trying to make it as good as possible. Now, the idea is a security kernel is invoked every time you want to, well, do something that accesses a different layer. If you want to log into your system, if you want to access the network, if you want to write to memory, then you need something that accesses all of that and hopefully controls it in a manner that is secure. So when we're looking at um, direct access to memory for video cards and games and everything like that, that's why we need to really get down to the root level of the system and access it at a low, low level because we're telling the computer that this game needs to access memory directly. It's going to bypass all these controls. This is why it's also not terribly good to have a gaming machine that's shared by multiple people. Because while you're doing that, someone has direct access to the video, they might be able to access someone else's video memory. If you're doing direct memory access for video and multiple people are sitting on that server, you could watch them as they're going into their banking. So the security kernel is a small tested, verified part of the operating system. There's a security kernel in Linux, there's a security kernel in Windows 2008, etc, etc. It's all there. Every one of these has it and it has been tested extensively. It's not generally the kernel that we have a problem with. The kernel's generally quite secure these days. It's all the applications that hook into it when we allow access and we bypass the controls, that's where we, um, we have our problems. So, terms we need to know, least privilege, we've covered this one many, many times. Fundamental security concept, you have the absolute minimum rights to do your job, that's what least privilege is about. Multi-level security policy, these are things that prevent information from flowing from a high security to a lower security level. We have models here. Now. I'm not going to cover all of these. They are out there and you need to know them. What I'm going to do is put some links to reading. State Machine Model, Bell La Padula, uh, Biba, Clark Wilson, Information Flow Model, Lattice Model, Brewer and Nash Model, and the Graham Denning Model. You really need to know all of these quite well uh, for the exam. The reality is you'll never use them. I'm sorry to say. We have to learn all these things, but they're one of the conceptual layers of, um, of theory that once you've done all this testing, all the CISSP stuff, you can forget about it totally. I know I keep saying that. System security models are covered in Orange Book. Um, Orange Book covers an assurance model, and um, um, TCSEC and whatever else is an assurance model, which I'll cover in a little bit. So, also need to understand covert channels. Everyone know about covert channels. So, an example when we were talking about steganography, that's something that can be used as a covert channel. There are others. Nushu, for instance, is a covert channel. That is a way of hiding information. We hide information in ping traffic. Maybe 
when someone wants to leak and exfiltrate data from your organization without you knowing about it. They can set up something that allows them to communicate. Many versions of um, peer-to-peer network software now operate over covert channels. So if we don't control the information going in and out of our machines over different networks, which we'll cover in a little, a little bit, then it allows us to leak. So security model, uh, modes of operation, we're going to think about how we do that. And we're going to talk about different uh, mandatory access controls when we're looking at top secret, secret, confidential, and all the rest. So first of all, dedicated security mode. People have a need to know all data in the system, formal approval, everyone signed an NDA, world is lovely, everyone does what they're told, and everyone's cleared, and um, no one like Snowden comes out and leaks information. <laughs> so dedicated security mode, well, we need all of these things for it. High security mode, similar to dedicated, all users have NDAs, proper clearance, and um, not all users have need to know. So people can go across different levels. Now, based on what we're talking about before, trust and assurance. Now, first thing, there are no absolutes. Never get to an absolute here. Trust level is really how much protection we can expect out of a system. Where are we? What are we doing? What can we control? Assurance how much we believe the system will act in a correct and predictable manner. What are we doing here? How can we trust it? Do we trust what we're doing? Assurance takes us to the point where we know or we at least believe that the things are happening correctly. While we get audit is so that we can have some level of assurance what's occurring. There is a difference between trust and assurance and you need to understand the difference. So trust level is how much you expect out of it, what do you expect it to do, and how honest you believe that sort of that level of trust is comes down to the assurance. Now we have um, a few different things you need to know about um, TCSEC and the the red and orange book, the rainbow book type stuff, and um, but at the end of the day, ITSEC is a different, more modern way of doing it. The red book and orange book stuff, the rainbow books are now defunct, although they still ask you questions about these things. They've been defunct for quite some time. C2 and whatever else security levels are still talked about, but they're not real. They don't happen in the real world anymore. Okay, functionality. When we're talking about this, this is what it does. Assurance is the confidence that we have that it does these things correctly. We test it and document it. And this is important. You need to understand when you're looking at an assurance, you need to understand what the functionality is. There are many vendors out there will tell you, we have a level blah assurance device. So what? What is the functionality? Unless you read the functionality specification, you're not getting anything out of the assurance. So you need to understand what they're assuring you it does. So we have this level of functionality. We have an IDS. What does that IDS do? And you will learn that some of these different things actually only do it to a low level. Maybe they say we have a gigabit IDS. As long as we only load three signatures, we can scan everything at this level. So who cares? So. Maybe we have something like a fingerprint reader. We can read one fingerprint really well. Anyone else? Who cares? So ITSEC, we have F1 to F10 and assurance level E0 to E6. So functionality is our first part. We have to be able to say uh, what we actually do. So F1 E5 is low functionality but high assurance of said functionality doesn't really give us much. So we can say, we have a firewall that doesn't block much, but it doesn't block much really well. And so we need to understand how these things map together. And assurance matters when the functionality matters. 
when we do it correctly. So common criteria, um, Orange Book uh, can compare these things against um, La Bella Padula and whatever else, um, and everything maps then to a rating, so between EAL 1 to 7. And what we're looking at is a protection profile. Now to understand this, we need to look at the actual thing that we're talking about. How we map it and what we get from our assurance depends on the document. What vendors don't want you to do is actually read this thing because this document is like a request for a um, proposal. And it tells us this is the functionality we're testing against. This is how we're doing it. And unless you look at that, then you're not getting much out of these um, things. So what they're doing, they describe the elements, the name, the description, why they're doing, the rationale, the functionality requirements, how we're going about it, how we've tested it, and how we've evaluated it. Now, common criteria really comes down to something like a business RFP. If we don't read that RFP, just going, this is the price, doesn't matter. We need to look at all the different bits. So once we know we've evaluated it, then we have to also make sure we configure it correctly. So having a firewall and having it accredited to a certain level doesn't tell us much at all. We also need to certify how we're doing and accredit operations. You can put in a firewall any day and you can install it with an any, any policy. How much coverage do we get out of our firewall if we allow everything? Now, most attackers now understand shoveling a shell. Shoveling a shell is getting access because you have basically taken a Trojan or something in a machine and pushed access back to the attacker. So the attacker can manage your machine because there's a process on the attacked machine that connects back to them and watches for the commands. It's the same as if you were doing um, an SSH connection from your attacker machine back into the machine, except it gets pushed out through firewalls. So if we have anything allowed through the firewall going out, then we still have problems. So it's not just incoming, it's also outgoing. And if we don't set things up properly, it doesn't matter how good our connection's going to be, we're still going to be screwed. So certification, we have all the evaluation that we've been doing things right. We can have it third party, in-house, whatever else, and we can assure the measures are there. But what we need to also think about is how we accredit these things to ensure that we have implemented it correctly. If we don't implement well, it doesn't matter how good the security stuff that we have in places. Which toys don't matter unless we can say we are running them correctly and the configuration matters. So once we have put this in place, accreditation allows us to have management review the certification and say we understand the level of protection our system provides and we understand the risk. This is a big one here. Management takes the certified solution we have and signs off and says, we understand, we know the risk we're facing, and when they do that, that's when we have an accreditation in our organization. Management needs to understand, first of all, that it is their responsibility. They are the ones who are saying this is good, bad, or indifferent, and as such, it is their responsibility to ensure that they sign off on all of this. So, if they understand without, uh, sorry, they sign off without understanding, then they are the ones who take the risk, the lost, everything else, okay? So, remember, whenever we're doing these models, what we're doing is we're taking everything and we're putting it together in a way that the owner, not you, not the techie, not whatever else, the owner of the system can take and say, I know the risk I'm facing. Doesn't mean that they know the technology, it doesn't mean anything else there. It means they know what they are facing, the risk they are facing, and they can make a decision. They can decide they're going to do nothing, they can decide they'll do something, doesn't matter, 
as long as what they're doing is put together in a way that allows them to understand and sign off on that risk. They take responsibility. Okay, quickly, run out, grab yourself something, because in just a couple of minutes we're going to go over network security and then we are going to have a quick um, well, go over how they test you, what sort of things you have on the exam after that. So part two will be network security, looking at wireless, wireline, whatever else things uh, that connect you up to the internet and other technologies and allow you to get access to the world. This is a big aspect of security, lucky last but not the least by a long way because well, we've moved away from this whole idea of people connecting out there in the world by mainframes and other such things. Mainframes, well, they're still there, but even those are wired up to the internet now. We are in a connected world, and this connected world works through people using it over different areas at different times. And this is what we need to understand really well. If we can stop people getting in from the internet, we can stop many attacks. But the reality of that is never going to happen because we can't make perfect security. That's why we have all the other controls, making sure that we have the right people, the right processes in place, the right detections and understanding, as we've been saying, when we discover an incident, we can react to it and do something. So as I've been saying, and as I ramble on here in the background, I'll give you two more minutes and then we're back to it. So, ah, uh, new shoe is, um, uh, uh, it's named, it's by a researcher from Poland. Her name was Joanna. It's um, named after a Chinese um, secret woman's language. Um, she's a female researcher and she's named it after that. It's a language that was used by a lot of Chinese women to talk uh, without their husbands knowing. So it would be communications where they seem to be having a an ain chat about nothing, whereas they're actually talking about all sorts of other things that they didn't want, like a coded language. So in this case, it's a covert channel designed to go through firewalls, especially ones that don't block things like ICMP which is the majority of ones I'm sorry to say that I've seen out there. Um, no, people don't need to ping your web server. If they do, too bad. Give people what they need and no more. That's just my way of looking at it. But um, I'll put up some links for those things as well so that you can have a bit of a read about um, Nushu and other technologies that are designed to hide information. Um, Joanna's done quite a lot of research into this stuff and um, uh, also covert channels in uh, VMs and other such things. So if you can wait till tomorrow, there will be some links put up there for you to grab all of this and um, go over it. Here's my end of class question before we start part two. And what's that, Darren? Oh, that's a big question. I've never seen a security event log. Find one occurrence. Yes, sometimes. Ooh, making me read here. Um, reality is. You're not going to find out everything that every process is doing. If you're talking about a modern operating system, thousands of things. So it's about trust. We have to trust that the operating system, that the uh, applications are doing what they're saying they're doing. And uh, personally, I stay away from uh, uh, certain products and bitch about others like Adobe uh, because of that, because they don't actually well, they don't take as much care as they really should. Um, I will be putting up some extra stuff, including a, um, a video I've done in the past, 
uh, all about um, uh, well different levels of operating system etc um, could I repeat the question unfortunately I can't Darren's given me something that is about half a page long so um, Basically, the answer is I will be putting up stuff on the um, the forum that will allow you to go into depth if you actually even want to learn about um, some reverse engineering. I'm going to be also there'll be follow up stuff that will allow uh, allow you to go far deeper into all of this. All right. Anyway, you should have your coffee, tea, whatever else, and we're back part two: wireless and wired network security. So we have network models. Now these are layered models that describe networks. They don't really exist. Okay. What we're doing is we have a layer n thing. This layer n requires a layer below it and provides the layer above it. So this helps us have a conceptual idea of how things work. When we talk about it, we're talking about exchanging layer n to layer n. That's what we're talking about here. But we stack things on top of each other, so we call them a stack. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about how we implement different, well, ways of communicating between programs, the system, operating system, whatever else. And the most well-known of these models is the OSI, or Open Systems Interconnect. Now, you'll need to know two different models really well for the exam. One, OSI. Two, TCP. If you know both of those, then you should get through quite well. You're not going to have too many problems, but um, lots of stuff there, and I'll also, again, put up more reading for you. So our seven-layer cake here goes from physical data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. So from this actual machine layer right up to the web browser or go to meeting client or whatever else you happen to be using and we can abstract it. So the physical layer, these are the types of media you happen to be using, all the different things you actually use to connect. It's how we represent information on the medium, what we actually do. Now, most of us don't need to know, is a zero a high? What is a plus five volts versus a minus five volts versus a no volts situation? We don't need to really understand that. What we need to do is interact with the application. But if you're a hardware designer or something like this, this matters. So our physical layer is how things interact at the low level. What bit order we have? Maybe it's parallel, maybe it's serial, all of that stuff. Data link layer is then how we communicate between the physical and the network. Something like write to transmit. Maybe we're doing a message stick type scenario like token ring, where we hand things um, one layer after another. It all varies. So we have to think about how we do this. Um, uh, also, some questions uh, there. I missed one. Um, what's your opinion on FreeBSD as a safe or secure operating system? Uh, no such thing as a safe or secure operating system. There are things that you can lock down better. It's all about functionality. FreeBSD is good as something for a level of functionality. Um, my understanding, TCP IP is the only model that is currently working. Well, they're all working. None of these are real. So you'll hear about now layer 2.5 devices for fast switching and things like this. This is a conceptual thing. A model is not reality. It is a way of understanding reality. Okay, so it is not everything. Now, layer 2, data link layer, this is our right to transmit, directly connected host to host. It's really the higher level of frames and it takes our physical address structure and allows us to grab all of that and what we're doing. It is really 
all about how we take the actual machine, the hardware, and start talking to the wire up there. The network layer is how we communicate to the world. So how we send stuff through routers and connect our machine out there to the internet. End host to end host data transfer across what can be many, many links. It's a higher level abstract, abstraction, so packet level. And um, it's really something that we talk at the host level about. Transport layer, this is process to process. Once we get our machine, breaking it down right into the level of the machine here and what we're doing for our machines and how they take everything, how they can talk over time, how they can distribute things. So it may provide reliable transfer, but it's datagram streams, etc. High level data abstraction. Things like port addresses and processes, uh, how we do things at a high, high level, then um, we don't need to understand this and um, really we can start looking at how your browser can talk to a web server and what it connects to at the same time as your email client talks to the same machine sending email at a different port. So session layer, logically consistent connection. So different processes over time so that if you've got multiple tabs, they all remember where they go. You can have login, encapsulation, database access, etc. Presentation layer, how you represent things, whoops, um, things like ASCII, byte encryption, compression and all that, and the application layer. So how you access the network, the actual thing you've got displayed in front of you, what is there, and um, how you interact with it. So TCP, this is that thing that we see and communicate with. This is not just a model. There's a TCP itself and there's a TCP model. They're two different things. When we're talking about TCP IP, we have both the model and the actual protocol. So for the moment, we're going to actually think about the model. What we have in the model are layer one and two, which is our physical and link layer, the layer three inter-network layer, layer four transport layer, and layer five, which is everything else abstracted up there as a big whack. We don't really care. Now, layers one and two directly correlate to the OSI. TCP IP actually came out over a decade before the OSI. So this is why there's a little bit of difference. The OSI came about as a academic way of putting all this together so that we could understand um, potential network uh, programming issues, etc. And what we're doing is whacking all this together um, and in TCP, this is quite often as one layer. Layer one and two is represented as a link layer, single link layer at times. And it is how we connect to the network. The TCP IP model didn't really care about what the physical hardware was. It didn't care Ethernet versus what I do on the wire. It was an abstraction for connecting machines over the internet. So we had this link layer somewhere we connect to the world. And then how do we route that? How do we address it? So first of all, internet work. Whether we're talking IP version 4 or version 6, this is how we move data between the networks, the addressing, the routing, etc. So at this point, we're talking OSI layer 3. Transport layer, everything necessary to move data between our applications. OSI level 4 the ports, and then layer five, all these other things, specific application stuff. When they, they, they first programmed all this, they didn't care. It was only, there'll be stuff done up there in the future. No one thought about it back then. It was just, someone will do application stuff eventually. Remember, TCP IP came out in 1969, first of all. So there wasn't any of this gooey stuff, there wasn't any pretty stuff, there wasn't mice, there wasn't anything else. It was one day we'll invent other stuff and that will be an application. 
So it was really forward thinking. Um, Steve Austin worked for the OSI. You were, we're talking uh, a little bit different than uh, that. Unfortunately, yeah, CIA also means other things too. Anyway, la layer one, remember, we have all these things like copper cable. For those who are old and been with this forever, we have coax. We still have that now if we're talking about cable connections. Still there. Bulky, heavy, immune to noise very much. Twisted pair, cheaper. Fiber optic, multi-mode and single mode. We can get nice fast connections, long distances in this, and many people using it at the same time. We also have radio, microwave, satellite, and none of these are inherently secure. Not even fiber. You can tap fiber. Don't believe people saying that it is secure. Nothing is secure. You can intercept any of this. So layer two. Ethernet, token ring, FIDI, ATM, SLIP, these things that run over this other stuff. We have copper, fiber, whatever else, these run over that. So the data link layer talks about how we're going to connect. So when we're talking about Ethernet, fast Ethernet, SLIP, SONET, whatever else, Oh yes, unfortunately um, people try and tell you that fiber is untappable. There are fiber taps out there, so don't ever believe anything is totally secure. It's just trying to make you feel a little bit better. And we can even go up to wax string. So layer two would include two cans and a piece of string between them. So remember that. Ethernet, it's a very simple transmission protocol. Well, you listen to the network. I'm listening. Can I hear anything? If someone else is talking, I'm yapping away. You wait. You're just nice, and we sit there, and we wait. No one's talking. It's quiet for a second. I'll send my data. But if someone starts yapping as I'm yapping, then we scream at them and make them stop, basically. So like classes, someone tries to talk. We go, no, no, you can't talk. And we, well, stop them. So. Frames. First of all, we have between 64 and 500, uh, sorry, 1518 octets length. Octets being 8 bits. Frame has a header. That's our 14 octet bit. Now four, uh, four octets at the end for our check, and data in the middle. Our 14 octets are our six octets, which is 48 bits which is our MAC address. So we need our destination in our source and a little bit for type, although we can lie about type. So early Ethernet, fairly simple. Transceivers physically connect you to the coax cable. Repeaters amplify and repeat. And bridges selectively amplify one coax to another. And when we're looking at this, bridges are really just like a two-port switch. Um, and yes, as Paul said, CSMA uh, CD. So um, carrier detect at the end of the day. We also have other things uh, there. So why talk in octets? Because back when all this started, we were looking at eight bits at a time. So although our world has moved on, we still think about octets. And so if we talk about 32 bit for an IP address, we have four octets, two, uh, 0 to 255, 0 to 255, 0 to 255, 0 to 255. So those octets are how we define everything still. Hubs, these are um, just a way of whacking everything together. We started with coax and we've moved into twisted pair. These allowed us to, well, make a simplified way of connecting much. And a hub is just a repeater. It's just a little bit of a power source that takes everything and pumps it out everywhere. So everything on a hub gets shared everywhere. Switches provide, well, performance increases because we don't, well, have the problem of, um, well, everyone getting everything all the time. So everything on a switch gets split up into these little segments called a collision domain. 
And with a switch, you and the um, the switch are individually set on your own collision domain. For a switch, you can have many, many collision domains. On a hub, one collision domain. Everyone talks at the same time. So it makes far better communication. So switches, as I've said, are multi-port bridges implemented in hardware. We also have wireless access points. These remove the need for cables. We're moving into all these different things. So when we're talking about it, we're looking at a hub switch hybrid, depending on how we enable it. But we have to share bandwidth, so radio waves. We might have a few differences, of course, because we can have different channels, but even then, how we implement it, well, we might be able to sniff stuff, we might be able to have encrypt it, but everything's out there and it's not hard to see. So frames are selectively transmitted between segments, wired and wireless, and wireless systems can sometimes hear each other's transmissions, especially if you haven't encrypted it properly. So layer three, this is where we connect all those layer two networks together. Layer two networks, same or different technology, so we can have a gateway, connects all different stuff, whether we're talking token ring or 3G, 4G or wireless or whatever else, and it can be different speeds. So we can have someone on a modem connected up to someone talking to a really fast uh, fiber 10 gig connection. How they communicate, well, we're not going to flood everyone. We're going to talk just what the speed we can handle is. So IPv4 is the most successful layer three protocol ever developed. We have now billions of systems, billions of systems connected. Every time zone, every continent, even Antarctica. And more than that, we have even Mars. IPv4 is on Mars. IPv6 is also now on Mars. So we have these things and it hasn't really changed since the 80s. We have a new protocol. IPv6 is starting to work in the background, but that'll take a little bit of time for people. So when we're looking at IPv4, we have a 32-bit header and 32-bit blocks. So we start with a width of 32 bits and we have a header and a payload. Payload's what we're trying to get across to the other machine. As a user, we don't really care about this header information. We just know that it's like the envelope we put things in. And our, um, our header, I guess, is that envelope. The payload is what matters. But we need to get our envelope to the other side. So we need a source and destination address. That is where we're sending from and where we're going to. We can lie about our source address, just like we can lie about it on an envelope and leave it blank or do anything else. But if we don't have the correct destination address, then we have problems because we're not going to get there. We need the protocol. So in the header, we have a protocol. And this would be standard mail, express post, whatever else. And then we have all these other bits of control information. The version, IPv4, V6, the type of service, how long it is, like how heavy our package is, that sort of stuff, and a checksum to make sure it's okay. And any options or padding to make sure that uh, we get it there correctly. So IP addresses, well, this is something like 172.24.57.18, which the machine sees as 1010110000011. Etc. Machines don't really abstract it the way we do. They have on, off, on, off, etc. Everything needs an IP address if it's going to communicate with a TCP based system. All systems need to have some layer two address as well. But how they get it, that's what we're talking about with things like ARP and other protocols. But from a TCP point of view, it doesn't really care. All it needs to know is how we communicate over the IP address layer. So what we have, IP addresses and a network address. IP address, we have our host and network portion so that we know what is local or what is sent over the internet. Network masks, this tells us where the split is, whether we're local and whether we're out there on the internet as a somewhere else. So mask is a 32-bit quantity, just like the IP address, and it can be, once again, done with the dotted quad. So here we have a C class. 
C class is back from the old classful system. We moved into classless a long time ago, but here we have one 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 etc etc and a few zeros or two five five two five five two five five zero, and we put these together and we have our IP address and netmask, which gives us well two sets of ones and zeros there, and we can add those together. And once we start doing some uh, binary mathematics, we see why that matters. When we and those together, the ones will stay the same, the zeros will wipe out everything. So that allows us to get our network mask. So if we take, for instance, a 240 range, where we have all of this there, we can look at that as a 16 network. So we can look at our different network terms. For anyone who's done Cisco stuff or anything like that, there'll be some Cisco material that I'm putting, like um, training CCNA stuff uh, later in the year. Uh, for those who want to go right into this, plus I will have extra reading and how-tos and all the rest going up tomorrow. So we need to understand the difference of any structure of this. So we don't want to have this big cumbersome structure. We don't want to have to do something like one of my IP addresses, 2035721.10. What we want to do is write slash 24. So we put that down in a shortened format. Slash notation is how we do it. So what we're doing in slash notation is counting how many ones we actually have. Here we have 8, 8, 8, 24. 8, 8, 8, and 4, 28. So when we're looking at this, we can say we have 24 bits of the network. 28 bits of the network, and that means our C class or our 240 become, respectively, a 24, slash 24, or a slash 28. That's what we're doing when we're calculating that. Now, routers, these are the primary layer 3 device. These are the devices that allow us to communicate and talk across different areas, connect networks. There's two distinct functions. We can switch packets between networks. We also allow, well, mapping of network topography. If a machine goes up, if a machine goes down, how do we connect to different areas? All of that, that's the things we do with routers. So layer 3 switches, that's a newer term. They're really just fast hardware-based routers. At the end of the day, a layer 3 switch is a fast router. So it's a marketing term more than anything else. It can be a hybrid device. This is what I'm saying. Remember, when we're talking about models, it is not the be-all and end-all of the world. A model is something there that captures what we might be doing. But it's just a way of abstracting the world. Remember this, it's a layer of abstraction. So, yes, switches allow into VLAN communication, different VLANs. And sometimes we even chuck routing on top of that and have routing switch modules so that we have hybrid devices. But remember, this is a way of us understanding. What people can actually program a computer to do is different. So we can grow things up from layer 2, grow it down from layer 3, whatever else, doesn't matter it's an abstraction so that we understand it. So basic routing, the switching algorithm, looks at the destination IP addresses. It says, if it is one of my addresses, I'll just pump it out the local network. I'm going to just put it straight on the wire, so to speak. If it's not one of my networks, if it doesn't match my network addresses, I'm going to find some way of sending it elsewhere using link-specific mechanisms. Otherwise, if I can't get it anywhere on my local table, I'm going to send it to a next hop. I'm going to maybe put it to a gateway that I have that I know for where I need to send it, um, default gateway for instance, or if I've only got certain routes, I'll send it there. Otherwise, I say I can't get there. If I can't get to that address, basically, I say, well, can't get there, you cannot get to it, the end. All right, what is an up-to-date definition of a gateway? A gateway is like a router that changes between protocols. If you want to go from um, token ring to Ethernet, that is a token ring 
to Ethernet gateway. If you want to go between protocol types like TCP, uh, sorry, TCP IP version 4, IP version 4 to IPv6, that is a gateway. It is something that switches between different network types. One of the older ones you'd see would be netware with um, IPX to IP. IPX to IP exchanges were a gateway. So what we will see more and more now is IPv4 to IPv6 gateways. It's an exchange taking something from one type of network protocol or one network uh, form to another. That's what a gateway is. It's like a router that sends it to different types of addressing. All right, so routing tables. We need some mandatory information if we're going to be able to send packets across the world. We need to know a destination IP address, a net mask, and a next hop router address. We have optional information, layer two information, maybe, interface indexes, flags, um, how we send to the best way. We don't need that. We don't even need the source address. It's nice to have a source address because if we don't have a source address, we're not going to get communications back, but we can send packets out there without it having to get back to us. And there are reasons for that. There are broadcast um, traffic streams and things like that that just ping information out that we don't care whether someone talks back. So routing table, we have different ways of doing it, static configuration or dynamic. Dynamic allows routers or even hosts sometimes to update network topography as things fall over. How does it fall out? What occurs? And maybe if a router goes down, we want to push everything out another different connection. So it allows us to stay up or um, reroute traffic as we have congestion. Static, on the other hand, if we have small tables, we've only got one gateway anyway, and we don't need to change often, then static works well. Unfortunately, if we need to change much or update things, then we're going to have problems. So lots of different problems that we're going to find with static, lots of things we address. But if we have something that can update this, then maybe all our machines can just connect and just find their way to the internet or other hosts or whatever else. We have internal things, interior gateway protocols. Uh, these are things like OSBF, where we want to maintain our internal network topography. We also have exterior gateway protocols between sites. So internet connecting different organizations on the internet would be something like BGP4 exterior gateway protocols. Everything has the same goal here. We're talking about creating a consistent view of network topography. And so at the end of the day, it's all about ensuring consistency. We have also have other protocols. We don't have to worry too much about these, but they exist. Apple Talk, IPX, and DeckNet are out there. I still know of a few communication networks that run IPX, as awful as that sounds. Next, layer four, transport layer. These allow multiple processes and programs to use the IP network on the same host. So IP layer four may provide reliable. If we're talking about TCP, transmission layer, um, control protocol, then this is reliability built in. UDP, no reliability. It has to be done in the application. So two major protocol suites, UDP and TCP. And UDP is fast, connectionless, datagram-based, unreliable, quick, and dirty. It's out there for things like DNS, simple net, uh, management protocol, and network file system. It is quick, small, not much overhead, doesn't control things. And there are reasons to use this. For example, if you are doing video conferencing, you don't care that everything comes in the right order. So voice and video, yes, as people have been saying. If you do voice and video, then you don't want to have to have things wait so that you can reconstruct things in the right order. You just want it there. TCP, on the other hand, connection oriented, stream-based, and it's reliable once and only once. It's heavyweight. It's three-way handshake, and as I said, I'm going to put up some more reading and all the rest because we have to run through this fairly quickly. 
so that you'll be able to go through this. This is things like uh, file transfer protocols, where you want things in the right order. If you send a file and you don't want that file to be changed, altered or broken, then you need to make sure that it gets reconstructed in the correct way. So we have several different uh, protocols as well, uh, such as reliable datagram protocol, but we don't need to worry too much about those. UDP and TCP are the ones we need to understand. We then have layer 5 plus, session presentation application layers. These do things like Telnet, file transfer, simple mail transfer, RSH, SSH, HTTP, whatever else. All those things like talking and hypertext transfer protocol and many others. We have security devices that we need to think about firewalls, whether it's a packet filter, stateful communications, network or host-based, um, IDS, um, all of that. All of these things then help control access over the network. Domain name system. None of us want to have to remember IP addresses. We can remember certain ones. I mean, I know 8888, one of the, um, the Google ones. Uh, for application protocols, how many of them do we need to be familiar with? In detail, in depth, none. But you need to know the basics. You should know HTTP port 80 uh, by default, HTTPS 443 by default, SMTP 25, POP3 110, that sort of stuff. You need to know a little bit about them. What are they used for? But at the end of the day, you don't need to know um, everything. For those who are interested, I'll be putting up some material as well on um, um, SMTP and how you can use it and even how you can well, use something like Telnet or NetCat to jump out there and do your own. So don't ever trust DNS blindly. First of all, just because it looks like an address doesn't mean it is. You want to go to an IP address, but you don't actually know that the IP address you're getting to is going to be a trusted one. DNS is subject to attack. Not all DNS servers are controlled by good people. There are many of them around the world. Just because you get information doesn't mean you trust it blindly. So remember, if you go to a machine, it may not be the machine. So when we're talking about configuring hosts, we need four things. These are them our own IP address. We need to know what our IP address is. We need to have a network mask so that we can work out whether we're local or out there on the internet and how we're communicating. We need a routing table so we need to know whether we do route out there to the internet or local and we need to have a DNS server IP address unless we're going to remember all of these IP addresses all the time. So we also have man in the middle attacks as uh, has been noted. Man in the middle can defeat DNS uh, if people can intercept and be faster than our DNS or whatever else. Then they can jump in there and give us the wrong addresses. So we need to remember not to trust. So we also have dynamic host configuration protocol. We don't want to statically configure every IP address we have in the world. And that means we need to think about the information we're getting. Wired communication technologies, I mentioned Ethernet. Ethernet, fast Ethernet, gigabit, 100 bit, giganet, etc. In Ethernet, we have a frame based protocol, 14 byte header, payload, checksum, everything as I put up before. It is error detection. Carrier sense multiple access with collision detection, as someone put up before. CSMACD. So you need to know carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. Understand what uh, that term have some reading on it. I'll be putting up some more for you to read. You also need to know um, collision avoidance, which is something like token ring. Now, MAC addresses, that's the stuff we get from ARP, which is, first of all, XXX assigned to the manufacturer, someone like MAC or Samsung or whatever else, and then YYY, the six uh, byte bit there that we have, um, well, our machine. We have different types of um, Ethernet, 10 base, 100 base, 100 base T, uh, 10 base 2, 10 base 5, and this is connected with a variety of different cables. So category 3, 
the four twisted pairs, five, five E, uh, category six, category seven. So category seven is suitable for 10 gigabit networks. It's the big, fast, um, ooh, server grade type stuff. We have optical cabling and we also have bonded ethernet and many other things these days. Greater speed, etc. You need to know the differences between the different devices there. Uh, hub, repeater, switch, router, gateway. I'm not going to cover off every one of these in as much detail as I'd like to do, but I will be putting up reading for you to do. Token ring, not used much, but you need to know what it is. Universal Serial Bus, USB, it's a successor to RS-232. Have version 1, version 2 and version 3, hot pluggable and um, used to connect things. Now RS-232 is, well, the serial stuff we used to use for modems. So connects communication devices, fairly much replaced by um, uh, USB, uh, but if you want to connect to a Cisco router or something like that, you still need it. You also need to know HISI. High speed serial interface. These were around for quite some time, connecting switches and hubs and other things, um, disappearing now. FIDI, fiber distributed data interface, fiber channel, etc. Um, understand what a bus is. Understand what a ring is. With a bus, all the nodes in the network are connected to a single conductor. You have one break in the network and everything stops. So early network connections with Ethernet used to be. Uh, thin net connected by bus networks. They had to be terminated and if they weren't terminated correctly all the packets used to fall out the end. At least that's how we explained it to management. We used to say if you take that little cap off the reason it fails is all the packets flow out. Just think of it like a tap. If you break the end of a tap all the packets flow out and it doesn't work. You lose pressure. So that's how we used to explain it. A ring all the nodes are connected to two other nodes forming a circular loop. Break any conductor and everything stops. Star, this is more of a modern network central device such as a switch and we have everything one to one on that. So you can break a connection but no more. Wi-Fi, we have WLAN, wireless LAN and all these different ones. We have Bluetooth, um, etc. All different types of wireless. Now, we have 600 megabit per second um, wireless, uh, multi-link wireless out there, uh, but it's not really a, it, it's a sort of standard and even getting faster now. Wi-Fi security, well, there are a variety of things you need to know the differences and problems with WEP, WPA and WPA2. And um, WPA2 actually came out before WPA, but um, WPA, well, it came because hardware vendors didn't want to jump up where they needed to be. Um, also need to think about authentication, maybe even using radius servers. WPA and WPA2 operated in, or operate in two modes, either pre-shared key, which is PSK, you have a key on either device, no, difficult to maintain, or a radius server. So 802.11, so 802.1x authentication, individual key, more secure, and uh, much better to maintain. Bluetooth, personal area networks or PAN technology. So in theory up to 10 meters, although there are Bluetooth standards for 100 meters and it's the antenna strength that matters. You can actually have these things work half a kilometer away with the right antenna. So you can encrypt between paired devices but that chews up more battery so not everyone does it. We also have to know a little bit about IRDA, Infrared Data Association. Still there, even though it's being replaced, because people want to connect up their TV and put their phone to um, send stuff and control their TV. Wireless USB, WUSB is starting to pop up every now and again. This is like USB, apart from you know, connectivity of peripherals, printers, digital cameras, hard drives, etc., over this sort of um, connection. Near field communication is another one we're seeing. Now this is ultra short communication. We have it, it's like an RFID, radio frequency. So intended for cell phones and other things and we even have business cards now working on near field communications. It just gives short distances. So anyone who's used PayWave or anything like that will know about near field communications. Radius, 
remote authentication dial-in user service used to be used all the time for modems and other such things. Well, it's an AAA, authentication, authorization, and accounting server thing. Diameter is a more advanced radius thing. Don't really see it much in the real world. Um, one of these things that's out there, but uh, you need to know not much more. TACX, Terminal Access Control, Access Control System, and TACX Plus, which is Cisco and now open, and 8021X, which is Port Level Access Control, NAP, NAC, and other such things. CHAP, Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, PPP, EAP. As I said, I'm just going to point out some of the bits you need to know. I'm not going to go into them. I'm going to leave you to read things like PEEP, PAP, and all of the rest because we don't have enough time in this lecture, unfortunately. You do also need to know a little bit about network threats. These are the things that cause access problems, availability problems, integrity problems, whether it's DOS or DDoS flooding or malfunctions, people stopping our availability. So one example being teardrop, attacker sends malformed pack, uh, packets that are overlapped and um, break our networks. We have sequence number guessing, if we have our sequence number easily guessed, like we used to have in DNS and some old DNSs, then people could jump in there and man in the middle easily. Smurf, forged IP packets um, sent to target broadcast addresses, IPv6 doesn't suffer from Smurfs because there's no broadcast. So other things to understand, ping a desk, sin flood, worm, spam, phishing and farming, all of these are network attacks. And the big problem is, first of all, the big one is unnecessary open ports. At the end of the day, if you have 65,535 um, open network ports, then there's all this stuff for the attacker to attack. We don't need it all. What we need to do is load only the bits that are necessary. Okay, so unpatched systems are a problem as well. If we have these patches out there, load them. And if not, use firewalls, whether it's a host firewall or whatever else, so you don't have an open port to the world. Next problem, poor and outdated configurations. Plenty of routers sitting out there on the internet that no one's looked at. Exposed cabling. I've been to many places where you can plug in equipment and get onto the network. Now, how do we protect against this? Well, access control list, firewalls, intrusion detection systems. All of these things help. If we lock down what we're doing, less likely people can get in. If we only allow port 80 to our web server, then even if we're running other things, people can't easily attack them. IPS, we can look at things that we know. Prevention and network, uh, protection of network cabling helps if people can't jump in there and tap our cabling. Antivirus software, both at the network and host based level helps. Uh, private network addressing, I don't actually agree with this one. Um, I think that's an obscurity thing. But for the exam, private addressing is a countermeasure. I don't agree, but you have to say it the way that the exam wants it. Okay, first of all, close any unnecessary ports. Patch things. Think about putting gateway filtering and control what you need to do. All right, so at the end of the day, we're trying to limit what an attacker can do. So let's get on to the conclusion here. We're winding up now, and we're going to cover what you need to do and know. What to prepare, what to do, and if you want to pass this exam, how you get uh, through it. So first of all, preparation. Read, read, and more read, and practice. There are plenty of practice questions out there. The exam we're doing next week is a short practice version of all of this. It just gives you the sort of level you're going to have to answer on the real exam. But it's much quicker because we're not doing a six-hour exam. And um, to get through this, you need to have some idea of what's out there. You need to have an idea of the 10 domains we've covered, whether it's information security and risk management, access control, cryptography, physical environmental security, 
architecture design, business continuity, telecommunications like we've covered, application security, operation security, the legal and compliance bit, all of this needs to occur. All of it needs to be known and you need to know enough to get through and pass all of this different area. So know the different domains fairly well. Remember, 250 multi-guest questions. Our one next week won't have all those questions. We will be much quicker and easier than that. But when you do the real exam, 250 multi-guess, where you need to earn a scaled 70% or greater. You have six hours and you need to remember, you can become an associate of ISC squared, but you need to do a whole lot of other things before you're a full CISSP because it's designed to be a professional certification. Choose a study guide. ISC squared guide to CBK, Sean Harris's book are both good. Also, we have plenty of stuff out there um, that will help you. Now, Mick has asked which domain has the most questions. Uh, none. They all should be randomly distributed. So uh, how you go matters. So you'll have about the same on all of these different areas. Uh, oh, yes, I uh, should actually update that, shouldn't I? Sean Harris is now a bit further. Uh, what can I say? It's uh, updated all the time. Yeah, I'll actually fix that slide for you. There we go. Oops. Um, so Sean Harris has actually come even further along. Uh, there we go. There's our different bits and pieces uh, at the sixth. So, um, yeah, it's, there we go. Um, which domain? Well, you're going to have a bit from everything. Um, no CISSP coverage for DNSSEC. Uh, no, there can be questions on it. I very quickly mentioned DNSSEC and um, countermeasures and controls for DNS. Um, uh, as I said, there's lots of um, uh, reading there. Uh, you won't get too many questions on um, any of that, but there could be stuff for CISSP uh, there. Now, let's go through a couple que uh, questions. Let's have a look at this. This can be tricky for people. Let's try and I'll keep going a little bit um, and go past time, of course. Here we have a question up here. Consideration for which type of risk assessment to perform includes all of the following except. Let's have some guesses, people. What do we think? A, B, budget, Y. What, what are we looking at? Why would this be our issue? What are we looking at here in this? What do you think we're trying to cover? And in this case, I'll actually give you the answer first of all, which is likelihood of exposure. Let's cover why, okay? So, except. When we're talking about a risk assessment, we need to think about what. What are we doing when we want a risk assessment? So, we're consideration for which type of risk assessment, the type of risk assessment we're going to do includes all of the things. So culture, budget, and oops, capabilities. Now, we cannot choose a risk assessment based on the likelihood of exposure because we don't know that until we have done it. That is a result. So we don't know the likelihood of exposure before we have actually done some work. We have to actually start mapping out the threats, the risks, the um, other aspects here before we can get that. So some of these questions are a little bit tricky. CISSP doesn't always ask things up front. They make you think a little bit. The ISS squared 
people make you think about this. So when we're looking at this, consideration for which type of risk assessment. When we're considering a risk assessment, we need to think about the culture of the organization, what the people will accept and do. The budget, how much money we have to spend is important. It's no good going out there and saying, let's spend $100,000 to protect a $10,000 project. And the capabilities, it's no good getting the wrong type of people who can't actually do all of this. Will my questions also be tricky next week? Uh, some may be. I've tried to think about the types of things and some are harder and some are easier. But think about this and, and, and it's trying to get you through what you need to know for the CISSP exam. You need to remember, think about the question. Stop for a second and go through it. So what type, what are three types of access control? Let's go through these again. What are three types of access control? Yeah, risk assessment, whereas risk management is likelihood of exposure is the point. So yes, it's tricky. Risk assessment versus management, as Darren said on the first one. Now. Access control. What are we thinking about with access control? What is it we're actually talking about in a type of access control? It's not going to be authorization because that's something that happens after all of this. So it can't be B. We can quickly take out some of these things and say they're not correct. So when we're looking at this, types of access control, we have admin access control, physical access control and technical access control. Mandatory discretionary and least privilege, well we have mandatory access control but we don't have least privilege as an access control. Access management and monitoring. Monitoring is not an access control. So think about what it may or may not be. So in this case, we're looking at A, because administrative access controls, policy, physical access control, locking people out of something, a door, whatever else, and technical, such as a firewall. Two methods of encrypting data. Okay, give you the first one. It's not going to be substitution and transposition. Substitution and transposition are used in creating encryption protocols. So what do we have here? We've got block and stream, symmetric and asymmetric, and DES. We're not asking what are two types of encryption, two forms. We're asking for two methods. And the key word here is methods. So when we're looking at methods, how do we do it? What is a method? So block and stream are methods. Symmetric and asymmetric are types. So very similar, but this is... I'm particularly making these a little bit tricky for what I'm going over here for the practice exam, just to give you an idea of how you have to think. So types and methods mean a big, big difference for this sort of thing. Which of the following is a principal security risk of wireless LANs? Okay, what is a main primary risk that we're going to focus here? on. What is our trick? War driving, is that a risk or a threat? What is war driving? Is it a risk or a threat? Remember, we need a threat and a threat agent to create our risk, but is a threat a risk? A vulnerability, is that a risk in itself? 
So demonstrably insecure standards, implementation weaknesses, are they something particular to wireless? Implementation weaknesses, uh, weaknesses are always there. It doesn't matter that we're on wireless. If we have a bad configuration, we have a bad configuration. War driving is a vulnerability and a threat type thing. We can have a threat to our network, but it doesn't need to be there all the time. So implementation weaknesses are not that we can get rid of. And demonstrably insecure standards, well, we don't always have that. WPA2 is not demonstrably insecure. If it's set up correctly, it's actually quite secure. Yes, if it said unique security risk, it would make more sense, but they're trying to make you think. So lack of physical access controls is something for wireless. So let's go over one more. Computer forensics is really the marriage of science, tech, uh, computer science, information technologies, and engineering with what are these? And you can blame me for this one. What are we thinking here? D, scientific method. What is computer forensics? What is the point of forensics? So we've got a couple people with D and, and one on A. Investigate. Is forensics about investigation? I thought that was incident handling. It's law. Computer forensics is about law. Forensics means a process that can go into court. Okay, so what we're trying to do is not only investigate, it has to be methodological, but it's not about scientific method. We want to have something that is repeatable, but it is really about taking computer science, which is scientific method, and matching that up with law. We need to make it so that we can match that and put it into a court of law. At the end of the day, forensics is about law. It's about ensuring that it's out there. So we will be putting up some more stuff for you to read, some more videos, and after this course, I'll be putting up a whole lot more. I've just finished doing a longer more in-depth version of things where I have recorded whole day sessions. So they will be up in the next few months. So keep an eye out on um, things I've been putting up on Facebook and LinkedIn and even the university sites and things like that because within the next two months there's going to be a hell of a lot more out there. You thought there was lots already? You thought this was awesome? I'm going to be giving away about 40 to 50 hours worth of um, recorded sessions on top of this now. And that's only the start. If you think this is a lot, uh, by the end of the year, we want to have 100 hours of audio, video, and everything else up there. Lots of reading, lots of questions, and um, it's going to be up there for you. So lots. So it's only going to get even more in-depth. So I hope you've learnt something in all of this. I hope the material that we've put up there for you to read has been good and you're learning from it. You don't need to learn everything in a day. We are doing everything for those people who already have a bit of knowledge so that in just that small amount of time you will be okay. But if you don't have uh, the time to study in that depth now, don't give up. Okay? There is lots here. There is lots of material, and there's only going to be more. But it, remember, you don't need to do this next week. Next week there is an exam. But if you can't get that and you can, you're not ready... Take your time. Do a little bit each week. I will be putting more audio up there. 
and that audio will go into more depth. Okay? So learn. Get good at this stuff. And when you're ready, when you've gone through all these flashcards, then sign up for the exam. When you're ready, don't waste your money until you are. And I'm not going away. This is the interesting bit for you all. We're going to be here over time, and it's going to only get more in-depth, more coverage, and whatever else. So even if you don't have enough yet, don't fear. We are going to give you more, and not just with this course. We are going to put up ITIL. We are going to have stuff for Cisco. We are going to have stuff for Microsoft. All of it within the next year. So if you're a training provider, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to be basically undercutting you. Um, have a nice day. That's what competition's about. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to have lots of fun out there making sure that we bring education to the world. I'm not going to give you all the secret sauce and the details yet. Just know in six weeks you're going to find out a whole lot more. So those who can wait will get even more of an insight. It's been great going through all of this. It's been great hearing from you and going over it. And it's been great having all this session together for you. I love the fact that we've had all these engaged people here wanting to learn. And I hope you all do well. So, any questions before we finish up? I know I've gone over time and kept you for a little bit, as I always do. But, hey, uh, what is my email address? At There's one of them. So, would it be able to get an archive of the resources of the course material in one download? I don't know. Possibly. I'll have to ask the guys at uh, um, IT Masters. But either way, the, all this stuff will be there. So what we have here uh, ain't going away any time now. Before final test, uh, one practice test. I'd do more than one practice test, to tell you the truth. I'd make sure that you um, do things. Sent you an email and did not get a reply. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I do get to my emails eventually. I'm about ooh, 300 emails behind at the moment. Um, I apologize for that. At the moment, uh, and I won't give you all the details, but I'm in the process of hiring project managers, developers, and other such things. Uh, in the next month, an organisa my organization's hiring 30 people. And uh, between job ads and everything else, I have been run off my feet answering emails. So uh, if you sent me an email and I haven't replied, it's not that I haven't, it's just that I haven't got to everything yet. And I do apologize for that. Uh, I am working through them all. And as you might guess, um, I've had a few people, um, uh, well, that I'm trying to do. Um, so doing my best to get through them all. Emails, I, I don't lose my emails. I never delete in any emails, not even spam. So eventually, I get through that. So. Uh, let's see, kind of specific, do I think that four years in the US Army, SIG Corps, um, so Signal Corps and the BS, um, Bachelor of Science in Network Security, would fulfill ISC squared experience? Yes, I do. And um, as I said, I'm not always the quickest person on the, uh, the draw of my email, but um, definitely send me stuff and I will make sure that you help me on that one. My email address for those people who don't know it. Isn't this is terrible? Giving it out so that you can spam me away. Um, I hope not anyway, but. Out there for everyone. Send to everyone. Email there. 
archive don't know. Uh, hopefully it's been engaging. Um, oh, is there a plan for a project management course, PMP? Oh, strange you may answer, uh, ask that one. Um, simple answer is yes, but I won't give you more details. Before the end of the year, there'll be something on project management. Uh, PMP, PMBOK, uh, etc. Exactly what we're doing for it, I can't give you everything yet. But if you keep watching things, uh, in particular, a trademark, I N T E G. Oops, said that privately by mistake. Oops. Da, 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 where are we? Uh, da, da, da. Lots of questions. I-N-T-E-G-Y-R-Z. If you have watch a trademark that I've just put up, then you will find out information. My email address, craig.write at hotwirepe dot com. Okay, say that one again, Craig dot right at pe uh, hotwirepe dot com. There's plenty of the damn things. Not only that, but I'll even bring up and just to make sure that everyone can see it. Let me type in at pad. Da, 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 da. Waiting, waiting, waiting. V. Do. Bring that up. Big, 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 big. 72. Okay. If you can't read that one, there's something wrong. That is one of my many emails, if you need to know. So, project management. Yes, there is a plan for a project management course. Um, there is a program, uh, an ITIL one, there is a management one, there is a uh, whole lots of many, many things to be coming up. My email address is up there. I can't pr promise you that I will get to your email within five minutes. Um, I will do my best. Um, as I've said, unfortunately, I'm getting more and more behind and um, I do answer all my emails. I never forget anyone uh, just sometimes that people get things out of the world going hey I forget I didn't realize you remembered me <laughs> that sort of thing so I can't promise I'll get it to you straight away so where I don't reply I do eventually just as you might guess giving my email out to everyone and everywhere means I get lots of them okay that's it so good luck we are going to be continuing uh, with putting up everything like that and um, you've been a great audience, a great class, a great everything else and I have profoundly enjoyed teaching you. At the end of the day, I am proud to have had the opportunity to do this and I thank you for putting your trust in me and sitting here and giving me all your time. At the end of the day, I thank you guys. Have a great day and good luck. <laughs>